Well, good morning and welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill. I'm the pastor of Providence Church. Uh, we are a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America located in Evansville, Indiana. It's great to have you here again for another edition of a uh, Brief Time in God's Word. Today is Monday, November 16th, 2020. This is edition number 31. We are in season two of the Morning Devotional as we are working our way uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just give you some updates uh, just briefly. Um, it, it's been about a week since we have met, and um, I am now fully moved uh, to Evansville, Indiana. Last night was the installation service in which I was installed as the pastor of, officially installed as the pastor of Providence Church, and, and now with much of the uh, commotion and chaos behind, uh, behind uh, me, um, I can then now get back to uh, doing these uh, uh, Monday through Friday devotionals, and, and I trust they're helpful for you. As you can see from behind me, I've moved into my study, and uh, so the background, of course, should be a little more pleasing than uh, some, some of the more recent videos. But today we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew uh, chapter uh, 5, uh, verses um, 33 through uh, uh, 40. Eight. We won't consider all of what's here uh, this morning, and so as I've done in the past, we will probably break this up into numerous parts. But let's pray together first, and then we will uh, uh, briefly consider uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5, uh, beginning uh, with verse um, uh, 33. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your uh, word, and we thank you for this day that you've granted to us. We pray uh, that even as we enter this day, a new week that you have uh, providentially ordered, uh, that we would uh, trust you with all of our heart, lean not on our own understanding, that we would um, in all ways, in all things, acknowledge you. And knowing that you love us and you will direct our paths and guide us and lead us uh, right where you would have us go as the good shepherd uh, of the sheep. We pray that you would guide us this morning as we consider uh, these weighty matters that were proclaimed, they were preached by your son so long ago, but so relevant even now uh, for us as your people. We do pray for your people. We pray for those who may be hurting or mourning or grieving, who are struggling with various issues. We ask that you might help them. We pray that you would remind them of your love and favor and kindness and that you would be gracious to all of us, even as we consider your word, that your spirit would guide us. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we are in Matthew chapter 5. We are uh, right in the heart now of the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord Jesus Christ had preached uh, on many different subjects, uh, beginning with chapter 5, uh, extending over through chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 33 uh, through 37 this morning. I think earlier I said uh, through 48, but... Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 33. We're going to read through verse 37. This is God's word. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, Anything more than this comes from evil. Now here the Lord Jesus Christ is clearly dealing with questions relating to our word. He's dealing with questions that relate to both vows and oaths. Now they sound very much the same. The terms uh, and the implications uh, uh, sound very much the same, but, but they're really uh, not that at all. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson in this little uh, treatment on the Sermon on the Mount that we have been using as a springboard to some of the discussion, he makes this distinction uh, regarding uh, an oath. He says, an oath was concerned with one's future actions. A vow was related to objects and their use. Sometimes the effect was one and the same. According to the Old Testament, in swearing an oath, the Lord's name was not to be used falsely. And we read that uh, back in Leviticus in chapter 19. In Leviticus chapter 19, in, uh, in verse 12, we read how this prohibition was given. You shall not swear by my name falsely, 
and so profane the name of your God, I am uh, the Lord. And so it appears, at least on the surface, as you read these verses, that God, the Lord Jesus Christ is prohibiting any kind of promise, any kind of oath, any kind of vow. And we uh, understand that there are brothers and sisters in Christ who do take that position. While I disagree with their assessment and interpretation of, those, of these verses, it's understandable how they uh, come to that conclusion. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. But what is important here and necessary to see is the qualifier by which the Lord Jesus Christ uh, then explains that. He says, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And so what was happening is people were, in order to get around keeping their word, keeping their um, their oath or their vow, they were swearing by other things, either uh, by, uh, by a city, things on earth, or other substance, other, uh, other items, in order to then have some sort of out clause as to uh, what they said they would actually uh, do. And we know that the Lord can't be denying the necessity of oaths or denying their abiding validity. Um, we read, in, again, in the Old Testament, in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, um, in chapter 5, um, how we're told to be very careful about taking oaths because of the severity of them. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we read in verse 4, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. So when you vow a vow to God, do not delay, delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. And so we have the abiding principle established in, uh, in the, in the, in the, from the lens of the Old Testament regarding vows in the serious weight of such things. And so people were trying to get around the weight of it by swearing an oath, a vow, under some other thing, but not in the name of God. So, as Sinclair Ferguson wisely states in his little devotional book, that uh, people would do that, uh, they would swear by something else, not by God, and, and thus have some way of getting out of their vow. And of course, when they were pr uh, pressured as to the promise and the vow that they have made, they would say, oh, but I didn't swear by God, so uh, certainly if I had sworn by God's name, I would have certainly kept it. Well, see, that's the problem here, and this is the problem that Jesus is addressing. He's not prohibiting oaths. He's not permitting pr prohibiting vows. Last night in the installation uh, service, I'm sorry, Saturday night in, in the installation uh, service, um, the congregation took vows. Uh, the elders of the church took vows. I took vows uh, to do uh, uh, with God's help and His mercy and grace to do certain things. And that vow was made to our God in, in, the, uh, in the arena of God's people. So it was a public statement, a public vow, a public commitment made. I can't then later uh, shirk my responsibilities because I can then say, well, I didn't swear by God's name, I didn't swear in His presence, I didn't vow to Him, I vowed to something else or by something else. And this is what people were doing um, doing uh, in the days of Christ. And so he says in verse 33, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. And so if he's really undoing the idea of taking oaths and vows, verse 33 wouldn't make a whole lot of sense at all. And so the implication, of course, for the Christian life, uh, as we're dealing with it this morning, is that when you give your word, when you tell somebody you're going to do something, it's not the formula. It's not, uh, I swear by God's name that I will uh, come help you move on Saturday, right? It's not the formula. As Christians, we should be men and women of extreme integrity. We should have such high integrity and character that we do what we say we're going to do insofar as God and His providence permits us to do that. There are things that will happen. You may promise to help somebody move, for instance, on a Saturday, but Friday night you come down with the flu. 
Now, that's not your fault. That's something that happened uh, by God's providence. As members of the church, you have made vows to su support the work of the church. You have joined this church with, the, with an expressed diligence to help the labors of the church, to give to the church, to support its work, its ministry, to submit to the church. And you do that insofar as God enables you. You're in worship on the Lord's Day. You, um, you do these things, but people get sick. Things happen that are outside of their control. We're not talking about those issues. We're talking about things that you, have, so you can do something about. And we read in Psalm 15 about the man who shall sojourn in the tent of the Lord, who shall dwell on his holy hill. And we read in verse 4, the one who swears to his own hurt and does not change. And I have experienced in uh, my life, and I'm sure you have as well, people who make promises to you or have determined to do things and then conveniently wiggle out of that promise. That's not providence, my friends. That's irresponsibility. And so Jesus would have us live as Christians with high moral integrity to do what we say we're going uh, to do. We keep our word. We keep our promises. And this applies to so many different areas of life that time fails me to, uh, to cover all of them. But let me just give you a, a few. As Christians, we all have bills to pay, and we should pay them. And we should pay them on time. We gave our word when we, con when we uh, contracted with that company or that credit agency or the, or the mortgage company or whatever it may be to pay our bills, pay it on time. We should be men and women as Christians of high moral integrity to pay our bills. It, it's a good testimony of our, uh, of our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Within our marriages, we take vows to love our spouse to until death do us part, and we should do that. We took a vow before God and others to do that. We can't wiggle out because life becomes inconvenient at times. And so there are so many different areas in which this really does apply. But the long and short of it is the Lord Jesus Christ would tell us that we should keep our vows, we should keep what we swear, and we should do what we're able to do insofar as the Lord wills. And James talks about how we should not boast about tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But if you say to somebody you're going to do something as a Christian, you should do it. And you should make every effort to do it. You should order your day, your week, with that promise in mind that you will do what you said uh, you uh, would do. So we let our yes be yes and our no be no. We'll deal more about the issue of truth uh, in tomorrow's devotional. But for today, let me just leave you with that simple, uh, the simple statement that as Christians, uh, we don't swear falsely, we don't make false promises, we don't make vain promises. We say what we're going to do and we do it. We're men and women of our word. Imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ was not a man of his word, and indeed he was. He promised, he covenanted with his Father and with the Spirit to come and rescue sinners, and he did it. Even in the hard times, in the difficult times, in the suffering, and the scorning, and the mocking that he underwent, he did not quit. He did not give up. He kept his word. He kept his promise. And he came you know, to rescue sinners from their miserable estate. Had he gone back on his word, had he not done what he said he would do, we would be but a people to be pitied. And so as Christ is our example about on these matters, we too as Christians should then pursue that example. Well, I trust the Lord is, uh, blesses you with these times together uh, each morning. If you would like to leave a note or a comment, you can do so. The information is there before you. And so until tomorrow, may God bless you, may he help you, strengthen you uh, to do what you say you're going to do, whether on the job, in the home, wherever it may, you may be. May you be men and women that are, have high integrity and do exactly what you say you're going to do. God bless.